It's good to see you back here at Grace Bible Fellowship. We are going into chapter 3 of Genesis. Everything has been wonderful up to this point. Adam and Eve have been doing well. Everything was created. God pronounced it very good. And all was well. God produced a woman. And suddenly man continued on with his naming game. And he says she should be called woman. And finally he found one that was like him. And uh, I, I still want to tell a joke. I won't. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. As we come before your word, I pray that you might help us to view it with your spirit's enablement, that we might see things that you have for each one of us, things that maybe we've never seen in this very familiar story. I pray, Lord, that you help each heart here to be open to your spirit as you speak to them concerning their relationship with you, including myself, that, Lord, we would be pleasing to you in every way, that we would hold nothing back. I pray today we would hear your voice, Lord, speak to our hearts. We give you ourselves, we give you this time. We pray that you use it for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. If you remember what we've been going over, we've been going over the six days of creation. The first three were God's forming. The second three were God's filling. And he appointed those who would occupy the space in which he created. So we, we looked at that. Last week, we looked at chapter two, we went over the seventh day and how God rested on the seventh day. We looked at the garden and the condition, this antediluvian weather report of how everything lived. And there was no rain up to this point, but this mist would rise up. We looked at the full story of mankind's creation. So it wasn't just man uh, in the mankind sense. We saw man and woman being formed uh, from a side of the man. We looked at all of that last week. Uh, everything is archived on the, the website, so if you want to go over that, I'd, I'm not going over it in detail. I'm just kind of brushing over it. And, of course, the first marriage, the very first institution that God created as he created woman for man. So we talked about on the seventh day, if God was tired, what exactly was he trying to do? Certainly he left an example for us that we would have one in seven. You will find that your body, your mind... All of your systems have a limitation. Any, any of you, amen? amen? You have a limitation, yeah. There's only so much that you can do. I know that when I spend uh, long days and long nights and I don't get enough sleep, I begin to see things. Yeah, that's right. See things? Yes, yeah, see things. Do you talk to yourself? Yes, often. You know, I have, I have like little scars in my eyes from dirt and debris and stuff getting in my eyes. And so if I move my eye, I see something move over here, but it's just something, it's a scar tissue in my eye. They're a floater. And suddenly I go, what was that? <laughs> and the mind begins to play tricks on you when you're here late at night and it's all dark except for your office. And you hear noises that are unidentifiable. <laughs> all of us have limits. And if we don't watch out for those limits, if we don't understand them, Obviously, physically, we want to take care of ourselves because uh, a fool dies before his time and Twinkies is no way to live your life. So Amen. the seventh day is designed for rest. Sometimes you can give your body a rest. It's called a fast. It's not a bad idea. It gives your body a rest and then you can rest in all those aspects. We saw that we are no longer under the law, but we have been freed from it. We looked at the, the seventh day and how God enforces that with the death penalty. And aren't you glad you're not under the law? We talked about that last week. No more law because we're not under law anymore. We're in a relationship. And it says here in, in Colossians 2, 13 to 17, let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths because those things are just a shadow of what is to come, which is found fully in Christ. And so we're not attentive to being fastidious about keeping the letter of the law without understanding the spirit of the law. And so uh, we, we discussed that last week. Uh, entering our rest means to enter into Christ. 
and I hope each and every one of you within the, the, the sound of my voice has entered into rest that comes with knowing Jesus Christ. He literally is the seventh day. He is our rest. We talked about how there is no, there was morning, there was evening, there was morning one day. Doesn't say that about the seventh day, which is peculiar. Not that I believe it was more than a 24 hour period or less, but I think the Holy Spirit intentionally plays with the text like that. So we scratch our head, not just to look at what's there, but what's omitted. And I think it's because the seventh day is special and Christ is to be the very uh, picture of what the seventh day truly is. Then we talked about the weather report and how everything was in the garden, how a mist would rise up in the morning, it would water everything. Uh, boy, wouldn't that be nice? He'd never get stuck in the rain. Just don't go out early in the morning or late at night because it's misty. We talked about how God created man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being and what that means to have a mind and a body and a soul and a spirit and to be made in the image of God and how he breathed his breath, his ruach, which is the, the word, uh, which is pneuma in the Greek, which means breath or spirit or wind. And we're going to see that here in chapter 3. Everything was good in Eden, and we were introduced to the two trees. The one was the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, that's the only tree you can't eat from. And guess what we went for? So we'll be pulling that up here in chapter 3. And then the one, which is the tree of life, which is rather interesting. And the scripture talks about Jesus dying on a tree. And it's that same tree that gives us life, which is the crucifixion and the cross of Jesus Christ. So we talked about what the tree of life could be. We talked about where it is and where you can look for it, somewhere in that red dot. But it's, it's not there anymore because of the flood. We, we talked about the purpose of man being placed in the garden was to work the garden. So work was before the fall. God put us here to take care of things. Makes me, makes me take serious um, what it is I believe God's called each and every one of us to do, which is be a good steward of this place, including the animals, including killing the insects. That's part of subjugating. I take it seriously, especially if you get those big cicada killers. Oh, suddenly sympathy, okay. <laughs> Or, or, the, or the big giant carpenter bees that are eating my house. I, I, have, an, I have an Adidas racket for them. <laughs> so the Lord said, it's not good that man is alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then he brought all the animals to him, which seems like a commercial break from what God's doing. And he brought all the animals and man named the animals, and which shows that he has authority, which shows that he is given authority by God. And whatever he called the animals, that's what it was. Nobody changed his mind. Nobody said, ah, Adam, no, I don't think that's a good name. I think, you know, armadillo isn't a good idea. Why not? He, he's all armored. Why, why wouldn't that be good? So he names all the animals, and he realizes that he's alone. God showed him he had a need before he provided for a need. Isn't that good? Because if God provided for his need before he knew he had a need, he might try to deny it and say, I don't need nobody, which men have been saying ever since, but anyway. <laughs> And so he caused him to fall into a deep sleep, and he took a side of ish, which is the word for man, and he made an isha, which is woman. And then when he awoke, he said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman. She was taken out of a man. And suddenly we have a married couple. God gives away the bride, so to speak. And we see that Jesus gave birth to a bride from his side as well, didn't he? Just as Adam did. The four elements of marriage. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. First thing is, you get out of your parents' house. Oh, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> get out, trust me. It'll be better for you. A husband and wife begin a new paradigm. They begin a new authority structure all other family takes second chair to the marriage relationship. Amen? Amen? Like it or not, that's the way it is. 
So get the heck out. Number two, cleave. Men, it's, a, it's what we're supposed to do, is give effort and energy to pursue our wives, to put energy and effort into the relationship. An investment of time, finances, patience, love, consideration, compassion, and the other's ringing a bell. <laughs> That's what we do. We cleave, which means you're not the king of the remote, and you sit around and wait to be served. It means you get busy investing. Right, honey? That's right. And they shall become one flesh. This is more than just the physical union of man and woman. This is everything that's mine is yours. Everything that's yours is mine. All of your debt is my debt. All of your pay is my pay. <laughs> and my wife says amen. Because my check goes in the bank and she spends it all. Amen. It's a good arrangement. It's a very codependent relationship. So, oh my... I am not serious, okay? I'm playing with you. We share everything because it's a three-legged race. So all of my family is your family, sorry. And all of your family is my family. All of your friends are my friends. All my friends are your friends. Your car is not your car. Your car is the Lord's car, but we share it, okay? That's what it is to be one flesh. It means my stuff is your stuff. Your stuff is my stuff. There's no yours and mine. There's ours. And... They were both naked and unashamed. Boy, I'm really messing up today. They were both naked and unashamed, which means they were completely open and honest and there was no hiding anything. Nakedness is a picture of what it is to be completely open, honest, transparent, accountable, honest, and not lying. No secret lives, no secret anything. Everything is open and disclosed. They were both naked and unashamed. They had nothing to be ashamed of. Little children still have this freedom. <laughs> the rest of us cover up. <laughs> and we were in Ephesians chapter 5 looking at what wives are to do, what husbands are to do, and the husbands get this much instruction and the wives get this much. But it's powerful, right? Wives submit unto your husbands as unto the Lord. So it's not because he's worthy, not because he's smarter, not because he's more spiritual, less spiritual, but because God has placed him in that position and you do it unto the Lord as if he were Jesus himself. Silence entered the room that day. <laughs> Husbands, you're to love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself sacrificially for her. So men... The picture of Jesus Christ as a husband is not a tyrant. It's one who serves, one who stoops low, who washes his feet, who finds needs and provides and protects. Amen? That's the ideal marriage right there. A respectful, submissive wife to a man who leads and dies to himself all the time. Perfect marriage, right? Doesn't always work that way, but that's, that's the perfection that we aim for. So we leave Adam and Eve in the garden, married on their honeymoon, all is well. Notice the nice PG silhouette that I have up for you. You look up Adam and Eve in the, in the, in the garden and you get all kinds of you know, crazy naked pictures. So there you go. I, I hope you appreciate my selectivity. So this week, we're going into chapter three, which is the fall of mankind. A story which you're all familiar, I'm sure. Uh, and so, especially if you've gone to Sunday school. If you've gone to Sunday school, you may have seen this very picture. But we'll talk about what it is to fall. We're going to go over the tempter and temptation. We're going to look at the lie and the fall. We're going to look at the confrontation and consequences. And then living in this condition. We're going to look at those things. Before we do that... Pray with me, please. Lord, guide us as we go in, as we look at your word. Help us to understand it in the way in which you wish it to be delivered to our hearts. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The first section goes up to verse 7. Now, the serpent 
was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. I'm wondering how many of you have questions about this text? None of you. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, two of you. Good. I thought we could just zip right through and go to verse 8. The serpent, we're introduced to the nakash. The shining one is actually what it means. This is the first time that you see this evil characters show up in the personage of a snake. From now on throughout the scripture, you're going to see Satan, who is Lucifer, the fallen angel, referred to as Nekesh, or you're going to see him referred to as the dragon. Same reptilian family. So it's rather interesting that there is no definition, there's no introduction other than there was a serpent and suddenly it could speak or communicate to Eve. And this is how Satan came and caused the fall. Nekesh is the snake or serpent. And it's funny that the, the word Nekesh comes from the hiss sound at the end. It's, it's the animal that, it's the bright shining one that goes shh. So that's, Hebrew is kind of interesting that way. But in, in Ezekiel 28 and also in Isaiah 14, I was going to get into a whole study on who Satan is and Lucifer and his fall and the I will, I wills, and, but I didn't because I didn't want to go on for two hours. So if you want to look it up, it's Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, easy to remember because they're divisible by seven. That's the only way I remember things. The first thing he does is he questions God's word. You will notice when Satan comes to you and tempts you, it'll be the first thing that happens. Did God really say you could only have one wife? I have to consider that. Maybe the Mormons are looking for somebody, you know. <laughs> Did God really say? Did God really say I can't drink alcohol? Did God really say that I can't go to the dispensary and get marijuana? Did God really say that he did say that he created all things for our enjoyment? There's a passage. These are the kind of things that Satan does, and he does it with the Word of God, as you're probably aware of if you've read through Matthew. The temptation will always come at, did God really say this? That's the first line of defense for us. So what do you think we should do about that? Know the Word of God. Because if you don't know the Word of God, you're wide open. Notice, he brings attention to the forbidden. He talks about, has God said that you can't eat from every tree? That is so narrow-minded. Who does God think he is keeping something from you? You see, he doesn't talk about all the trees that you can eat from. He talks about the one that you can't. That gets all the attention in this conversation. It's like being on a diet. Diets don't work because food's the focus and the food is the thing you're trying to get away from. <laughs> right? Let me weigh my food. Let me talk about my food. Let's find recipes for the food. Let's... I'm trying to get away from food and all I can think about is food. Why? Because I'm on a diet. 
That's sin nature for you. The forbidden thing. And he puts what God put in the positive, every tree you may eat from. He says, you can't eat from every tree. You see how he uses the negative and he uses language? Language is hugely important. Pay attention. God, because of his great love for us, places limits upon us for our good. Considering all he has done for us, how can we doubt that? Considering all that had been done for Adam and Eve and all of the fruit and everything that was in the garden, how could she possibly question God's character that he was keeping something from her? But that's the beginning of temptation, isn't it? Hey, it's a nice new Ferrari. That would be nice. I wonder what that's like. Did God really say I can't have a Ferrari? No, the bank did. Satan comes, works through the serpent, speaks to Eve, not to Adam. Curious. Speaks to Eve and not to Adam. By the way, God gave instructions about these two trees in the middle before she ever existed. He was in charge from the beginning. The devil always tried to find a back door, a secondhand way to be able to sneak around the corner. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. I'm wondering, how many trees are in the middle of the garden? How many trees are in the middle of the garden? Shout it out. And by the way, those two trees have a name, don't they? Why didn't she know the name? There are two trees in the middle of the garden. Knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of life. Very good. You guys are very good. Why is the tree of life not even considered? Why did they not eat from it first? Why was it not, I mean, wouldn't you go right for the good stuff? Like rush right to dessert. Tree of life and they'd live forever in that particular state of innocence in which they were in. And boy, don't you wish they made that decision. It saved me a lot of trouble. Did God say don't touch it? No. 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 God never said don't touch it. He said the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Know the word of God. Because if you don't, you're wide open to temptation. Right. No, he never did say, don't touch it. In fact, if they're going to be raking and hoeing, and if they're going to be mulching, and if they're going to be fertilizing, I imagine they'll be touching some of that fruit, but just don't eat it. It's kind of like apples that you find down here in the corner, sitting on the ground. Don't eat it. So why did... Eve add to what God said. Well, you can, you can ask three rabbis and get five opinions, but here's the deal. Whose job was it to tell Eve? Knowing, knowing myself, telling my wife, like uh, whenever you open the hood, don't put your fingers near the fan belt. In fact, don't put your fingers in the engine compartment. In fact, don't ever open the hood. <laughs> Just let me know. It very well could have been Adam's shortcoming in adding to what God said. You know, there are plenty of churches and religious organizations that are continuing to do this. Just adding to the word of God. In the first century, Jesus was up against the Pharisees who had added so many things to the word of God. They defined what could and could not be done on the Sabbath. They defined everything. And they percolated it down to the finest degree where no one could measure up. Adding to God's word. Revelation has something to say about that if you look in the very last paragraph. It's just as well to take away, like not knowing the name of the tree in which she's being tempted to eat. That may have been helpful. Was it Adam's issue he didn't communicate it? 
or she just like tuned out when he started speaking. Oh, he's getting all authoritative on me. Yeah, whatever, blah, 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 tree, okay, whatever. So I don't know, but there was a missing link. There was a missing link somewhere. I, I gave equal in, you know, liability on both sides. I think that's fair because it very well could have been. So Eve added to what God said. Big mistake. Be careful that you don't go away thinking, well, Pastor Dave said something. It must be in the word of God. <laughs> you better be like a Berean and check it out because I'm just a human being, if you haven't noticed. When we embellish or disregard what God says, we become vulnerable to temptation. And I don't know about you, but the devil has whispered in my ear many a time telling me, it's okay. God will forgive you. Don't listen. The knowledge of good and evil is not what it's all cracked up to be. The question that he created was designed to produce doubt in the woman, doubt about God's character. Did God withhold something from you? Oh, how unfair. It's designed for the appetite to be whetted. And the devil knows how to do it. Luckily, he only has three plays. We're going to go over that. The serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. That's a flat out lie, isn't it? For God knows that in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the proposition is, you don't have to do that. But notice that his lie is only a partial lie. By the way, we're going to read here in a minute that their eyes were opened. That they know good and evil, but not like God does. They know good and evil because they did evil. God doesn't know evil because he did evil, because he is the opposite of evil. So you see, with the lie is truth. It's like a candy-coated pill that will kill you. Be careful because there's truth in a lie. If you remember Jesus when he was tempted, the devil used scripture. Did Eve die? She did die eventually and slowly and progressively. Death was brought into the planet. But by the way, Eve doesn't take the rap. It's Adam who brought death. If you read the New Testament. Did Eve die? Well, there was, a, there was a spiritual death that occurred that day. It may not have been seen in the physical, but there was a spiritual death. Were her eyes opened? Absolutely. Was she like God? No. <laughs> Will she... Know evil and good like God? No, she knows evil and good like someone who's done evil. It's, it's like going to hit a hammer with all your might and realizing you hit the wrong nail. You now understand why it's important to hit the right nail. That's different than knowing, hey, I should always hit the nail and not this nail, or I should never put my hand next to what I'm hitting. I say this because these are things I've learned. trying to soften up the bone of my brain. <laughs> Don't carry on conversations with the enemy. Go ask God about it. Amen. There are some people that think they can go one-on-one -on -one with the devil. Ha! Devil! I'm going to take it. Don't do it. The angels don't even do that. They have a respect for authority. And if you look in the book of Jude, we see that Michael tells the devil, the Lord rebuke you. He doesn't take authority on himself, even though he's an archangel, which is... By the way, that's the highest echelon. That's like the general. So you don't mess with the general. But even he didn't take authority upon himself. He conferred authority. The Lord rebuke you. So don't carry on conversations with the enemy. Just tell him to shut up. You could say shut up, but only to the devil. <laughs> the question is designed to produce distrust. God will, you're not going to die. God knows. See, he's in competition with you. The, the one who created all things. Yes, he feels that you're like competition for him. <laughs> That's ridiculous. The question is designed to produce distrust and you will know good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food 
that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So she bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Notice there's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the three plays that the devil has, and he doesn't need more than three. It's those three. It says in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. We see that this is brought out in the New Testament as well. And if you remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was being tempted by the devil, he was tempted in the same three ways. He had fasted for 40 days and nights and he was hungry. And as he looked about him, he saw the rocks in the Judean desert that looked like loaves of bread. And he was hungry. And the devil came and said, hey, you could turn these stones into bread, couldn't you? You could have a meal right here. You don't need to call Uber or Grubhub, <laughs> drive through. You got it right here. You got all you need. You're hungry. Why not eat? Well, it seems like a simple thing, but God told him not to. Do you remember who led him out into the desert? The Spirit of God led him out into the desert. Do you remember who tempted him there? It was the devil. Know the difference between the one that leads and the one that tempts. Because God does not tempt any man with evil, neither is he tempted with evil. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed of his own desire. And so he was hungry and he saw these, yeah, just make, and he says, listen, the word of God says, by the way, who he was instrumental in writing, so he could remember it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus was sharp. Jesus knew what was going on. The second temptation was he took him up into a high place. And he said, listen, throw yourself down. Throw yourself down from this high place. Everyone will see you fall and the angels are going to come and catch you because the word of God says that he will preserve you so that you won't even stumble your foot on a stone. That's a very persuasive argument. And then Jesus would be recognized for who he is. Everybody would see him going, ah, you know, like a bungee cord, boom. And they'd say, I've never seen that before. And then he would get all the acclaim and attention and, it's the lust of the, lust of the eyes. Everybody would see you and think well of you and you won't have to go to the cross. The devil comes back to tempt him later with that. And the third thing that he tempts him with is he takes him up onto a high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. Must have been a video. <laughs> shows him all the kingdoms of the earth and the devil offers them and he says, listen, all these I will give you if you bow down and worship me. 40 days, no food being tempted of the devil. Number three is the pride of life. You could have all this without the cross. You could have all this without the cross. Any of you know about the lottery? I sense you do. You could, you could have billions of dollars without work. Yeah, you could also have a lot of trouble. And, the, and at that, Jesus tells him to hit the road. You're done. The Lord God, you will serve him only. And so then Satan leaves. And the angels come and feed him, which I think is pretty cool. That, that's a grub hub I'd like to see. Imagine being Adam as your wife reaches out. And by the way, it wasn't an apple. Time Magazine makes sure that we understand that Christianity is bogus because there were no apples that grow in that part of the world. Except they didn't tend to check the scriptures and it doesn't say an apple. It says fruit. You know what kind of fruit it was? I don't know either. <laughs> but it could have been a fig. I see Jesus walks up to a fig tree and he curses it. 
I see Israel being mentioned as a fig tree. I see them covering up with fig leaves. Very well could have been they were in the proximity of a fig tree. Don't know. Don't quote me. But it might have been. Imagine Adam. Here's his wife. Takes the fruit. And she's chomping away. And he goes, where'd you get that? Off this tree? This tree? I told you not to touch it. He's faced with a decision. My wife is now cursed of God and separated, and she's now brought death into this world. I have a choice. I can either follow her example and join her or be obedient to what God told me to do. Guess what she chooses? He chooses to do what his wife tells him instead of what God told him. And so what he does is he takes the fruit and he eats it. We understand from the Old Testament that Eve was deceived. She was completely in the dark as to what she was doing. But man knew what he was doing. He sinned with his eyes wide open. He knew exactly what he was doing. The rabbis postulate that perhaps Adam thought, if, if I don't join with my wife, then she will be accursed forever and I'll be alone again. And I love my wife so much that I don't want to be alone. I can understand that. I don't agree with it, but I understand it. And he takes the fruit knowing it's going to be death. It's interesting how the first Adam is a lot like the last Adam, who's Jesus Christ, who tasted death for us all so that we might have life. It's interesting, if he didn't take of that fruit, then we wouldn't have an offspring. We wouldn't have a Messiah. We wouldn't have salvation. And I see without Christ, we wouldn't have salvation. We wouldn't have freedom from sin. And so the first Adam is a lot like the last Adam, who was Jesus Christ, who did everything right that Adam didn't do. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 21 says, for he made him who knew no sin, meaning Christ, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Just as Adam took the fruit and brought death, Jesus refuses to be taken into temptation and he brings us life. Amen. Amen. So the eyes of both of them were opened. So it was true. And they knew that they were naked. Didn't see that coming. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. That's a strange selection to get dressed with. They suddenly saw each other differently. I, I check commentaries and they don't really have much to say about this. There are some that say, uh, according to Psalm 104, that God is clothed in light and perhaps they were clothed in light and the light had gone away, but there's no indication of that, I don't believe. But what I do see is there's no way that Adam could trust her ever again because she's not going to be obedient to God. There's no way that she can trust him any longer because he wasn't obedient to God. I find very often the one thing that will kill a nice, young, romantic relationship is premarital sex. Because after such, there's no way she's ever going to trust you being outside of her sight. And there's no way you're going to trust her. Because, my goodness, if she'll have sex with you, she'll have sex with anybody. And then you get the phone calls. Where are you? Who are you with? Who? Who's there? You better get out of there right now. I don't want you there. Where's all the suspicion come from? Why, why, the, why the, the third degree? Why? No trust. There's no trust. I never worry about where my wife goes. Guys hit on her all the time. I never get hit on, but she gets hit on all the time. I never worry about that. You know why? Because I trust her, because I trust God. But what happens when you undermine trust, when you commit adultery, when you do any of those things which will undermine trust, get stuck in a lie? Suddenly, the foundation of your relationship, which is trust, is gone. And what do you have left? You're just a couple of people that live in the same place 
and try to conduct yourself civilly. They covered up and they felt shame for the first time. Why? Because the thing that made them each unique and different was now on display for the other and they couldn't trust the other one. That makes sense? The very thing that makes the woman unique is now a focus that I have to cover up because you can't look at me. Why, why can't he look at her? And so they made clothes for themselves, which is a cheap imitation for the real thing. And they covered up with fig leaves. They no longer trusted one another to be naked and open. And that's what happens when sin is entering the picture. We cover up. We draw away. There's no more intimacy. There's no more openness. There's no more transparency. And so we have to put clothes on. Why do you wear clothes? Don't tell me because it's cold. Don't you wear, don't you wear clothes because you don't want people looking at your stuff? Because you can't trust the eyes of others. It's the same. They now knew good and evil experientially, not like God. They experienced evil. They did that which God said, do not do. They now have completely ruined their innocence and they now know evil personally, not from a distance or as a theory. From this time forward, mankind will hide behind a frail work of his own devising and an attempt to cover the truth of guilt and shame until Jesus comes. Without Jesus Christ, everybody's trying to pretend like their stuff does not stink. Like nothing to see here. Apologies are rare. Repentance is even more rare. Because people are busy trying to cover up. And there are lots of ways that we can cover up, right? You can be a super religious person. And you can try to cover yourself with the fig leaves of religion. Well, I'm doing all the good things. I'm doing all the right things. I'm doing everything that God tells me to do. I'm kneeling. I'm standing. I'm kneeling. I'm standing. I'm giving. I'm burning stuff. I, you know, I'm doing everything. I'm walking old ladies across the street. Are you trying to do that to please God? Are you doing that to make amends for your secret sins? Even as good as all those things are, they're no good unless you have a foundation of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it begins with a confession. I'm a sinner. Fig leaves. Careful that you don't select fig leaves to cover up because they're insufficient and they itch. <laughs> Next section. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree in which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave me with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So this is the big showdown. God shows up on, on the scene and there's a big hide and seek going on. Adam and his wife hide from the presence of the Lord. Possessing a knowledge of God without his fellowship. You get the idea that God did this on a regular basis that walked with them and talked with them and told them that they were his own. You get this understanding that there was relationship, there was fellowship. God brought all the animals to Adam and he named them. And you, you see that God's an integral part of their relationship and they have forsaken him. And he shows up. You guys know what that's like? 
You know what it's like to get busted in your sin? None, not you good people, okay. I know what it's like to get busted in my sin. And I know I have a relationship with God, but I've walked away from him. You know what? That's the worst existence. It's better to be an unbeliever, be sinning your brains out, having fun and not feeling anything. But that can't happen once you come to know the Lord God Almighty. And so you're truly a slave to righteousness because if, if you don't do the right thing, the Holy Spirit is not going to go away because he's a deposit guaranteeing my inheritance. And I'm going to grieve the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to drag that around. And I'm going to feel miserable trying to be happy. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, some of you might. Good. God has always been the seeker of us, not we of him. God has always been the seeker of us, not we of him. There's no such thing as a seeker. There are a lot of churches that make themselves, they call themselves seeker sensitive, seeker friendly. Well, I'm glad that the Lord Jesus feels good that he could be with you. That's good because he's the only one seeking because all have sinned and fall short of the, glo the, the glory of God. There are none who are righteous. No, not one. The poison of asps is under their tongue, we're told. Everyone is that way. We're all like sheep that have wandered away, but God has sent us a shepherd and somebody to restore our soul to be fellowship with them. God is the one who seeks us out just as he found Adam and Eve. And he always will be. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus when he comes back. So this could go easy or this could go hard. May as well make it easy. Hiding among the trees in the garden is futile, right? Do you think God couldn't find them? Adam. Gee, I wonder where Adam went. I left him right here in the garden. The question is designed to get Adam to think, hey, what are you doing? What's going on here? Have you ever had the Lord speak to you and whisper, where are you? What are you doing? Who are you? What do you? Who are you? What are you doing here? I have had that very thing where the Lord said, what are you doing here? Like Elijah in the, in, in the cave. What, what are you doing here? Hiding among the trees is futile. So don't try it at home. Don't try to hide from the spirit of the living God because you can't. And it's interesting, they hid among the trees, which is the very problem that caused them to be where they are. That's where we tend to hide. It's among the trees. And the Lord God called Adam and said to him, where are you? I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. My goodness, there's a lot of information. Where are you, Adam? Spiritually, he was far away. You know, God can't lie or be surprised. So he knew exactly where Adam was. The question was designed for him, for his benefit. And when God speaks to you, it's for your benefit as well. It's not his. He already has all the information he needs. Shame and guilt make us hide from God and breaks our fellowship with him and from one another. First, it was the fellowship with Eve got broken and they had to cover up. And then when the Lord shows up, they hid from the presence of God. Sin always makes us hide and it breaks fellowship with others and it breaks fellowship with God. Hebrews 4.13 says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him in whom we must give an account. I think it's interesting they use the word naked. The reason I thought of that passage is because it goes exactly with where they are. God sees us all naked. No matter how you cover up, no matter how you try to hide, God sees you right to your core and he knows every single thing that's going on. He knows what's going on in your thoughts more than you do because the heart is desperately wicked above all things who can know it. And yet God knows the deep things of our spirit. So there's no sense in pretending because God already knows. Interesting question. Who told you you were naked? Who told him? Who told them they were naked? 
Hey, you're naked. Really? <laughs> Who told them they were naked? No one. No one told them they were naked. Isn't that interesting? But it suddenly became a problem. <coughs> Another question. It's a tender question. See, this is not, this is not the voice of a police officer who's pulled you over and says, license, registration, and insurance. This is not the voice of a cop who says, assume the position, put your hands behind your back, and begins reading you your rights. This is not the angry God who comes with a sword to cut your head off. This is the tender heart of a father, says, where are you? A brokenhearted father. And that's how God comes. If you hear another voice that sounds remarkably like maybe your earthly father, that's not God. Because that's what he sounds like. Another question, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Notice a direct question with grace. Did you happen to eat off the tree that I told you not to eat from? You see, he's not afraid to speak the truth but he does it in love, doesn't he? There has to be a confrontation. We can't just ignore this. Right. We've got to talk about this. How many of you enjoy confrontation? That's what I thought. But there are things that have to be talked about. They should be done with love, but they need to be talked about, right? Have you eaten from the tree? Of course he did. It's another invitation for him to confess, you see? God is drawing him out. Hey, what's the matter? You're naked? Who told you that? Did you eat from the tree? It's like that's the furthest thing from God's mind. No, he wouldn't do that. Wait a minute. That would explain everything. Did you eat from the tree? Do you see the grace of God? And this is in the third chapter of Genesis in the Old Testament. And the man said, the woman. Did you eat from the tree? The woman. Whom you gave to be with me. Who's he accusing? He's accusing God. Be careful that you don't accuse God and you're accusing of other people. Then the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree. And what was that? And you're, what was that? And I, and I ate. So that's the last thing on that sentence is you. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent, she could have said, that you put here, <laughs> deceived me and I ate. It's the blame game, right? <laughs> and it's worse than that. <laughs> Why do you have such a temper, Pastor Dick? Well, you see, I'm Irish. My father had a bad temper. I inherited it from him. Oh, so you have no freedom of choice, I see. So you take no personal responsibility for your behavior. You blame it on your parents. Well, you see, I grew up poor. Oh, okay, so you take no responsibility for your stealing. You think you have a right to it because you grew up poor and God put you in that place. People do it all the time. They blame God for their misgivings and their bad choices and their sinful nature and their lack of personal responsibility. Blame your parents. It'll be three years worth of therapy, you'll be a lot poorer and you'll be no better off. <laughs> Accusations, excuses, or an explanation. An explanation tells how something happened. It's an excuse. It's an accusation. It's not an explanation. An explanation is, hey, I'm a bonehead. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I will never do that again. 
I want you all to say, I was wrong. I was wrong. All of you. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I won't do that again. That is an apology that begins with confession. Confession isn't the last thing on the list. It's the first thing on the list. And it's not, well, yeah, I did that, but you did this. Yeah, at least I didn't, at least I didn't do what you did. You see, that is not any part of an apology. An apology doesn't accuse someone else. Apology takes responsibility for your own actions. And understands that I burdened somebody else and you need to feel how they feel. And you better apologize. You better ask for forgiveness or else they'll bring it up from now on forever and ever. And you can't say, don't bring that up anymore. Well, you never asked me to forgive you, so I figured I'd just hold on to that. <laughs> and that's how it works. Because when you ask somebody to forgive you, you're asking them to drop the rock forever in the sea of forgetfulness and remember it no more. Please don't hold this against me. Please let me not hear every argument, this thing come up again. Please. <laughs> Just say, can you forgive me? And then you need to offer repentance, which is I'll never do that again. And I will take steps and I will prove to you I'll never do it again because you know what? I've got accountability. I've got, I, I, I'm going to change. I'm not going to do the same things. And I understand the anatomy of how I got to this place. And I'll never do that again. I'm building a fence first thing tomorrow around that tree. In fact, I may even start a fire. <laughs> Personal responsibility is best. And it should never be mentioned last but we tend to point the blame at other people, don't we? What's wrong with you? What's the matter with you? <laughs> well, you did something worse. Yeah, 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 but we're not talking about that right now. <laughs> Listen, we have, we, we're, we're little sinners that are all grown up and we know exactly how to do it. And we're so out of time. I got through 13 verses. Thank you, Jesus. I had the whole chapter done, but here we are. I know, I talk too much. Forgive me. Listen, I hope you guys are enjoying the book of Genesis. I certainly am. It's giving me insights into things about me. I hope it's giving you insights about things inside of you. The way God behaves towards us, his heart towards us, his love towards us. And you know, he's not surprised because you can never surprise the Lord. As the worship team comes up, I'd like you to solidify some things that maybe you've heard today that you didn't know or some things that you believe that the Lord would have you change. Because you have this opportunity, this pregnant moment where the Lord can use this to really cause us to change. And if you just heard an enjoyable teaching or if you just acquired some information, that's not nearly enough, is it? I would hope that there's real encouragement, that there's real inspiration that takes place, that the Spirit of God would help you to be what God would call you to be today. Amen.